Welcome to the Cambridge Union Society. It is my crazy excited honour to welcome Baroness Hale of Richmond. Baroness Hale graduated from Grat uh, Girton College with a starred first at the top of her year. She is the first and still the only law lord of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom and is now deputy president of that body. She's also been responsible for some of the most inspiring judgments produced by that body to date. A personal favourite is known as the Belmarsh case, where she ruled legislation incompatible with the ECHR because it discriminated against foreign terrorists. She said, no one has the right to be an international terrorist, but substitute black, disabled, female, gay, or any other similar adjective for foreign before suspected international terrorist, and ask whether it would be justifiable to take power to lock up that group, but not the white, able-bodied, male, or straight suspected international terrorists. The answer is clear. I hope you'll join me in giving a warm welcome to Baroness Hell. Thank you very much indeed for that introduction and for the invitation. Now I have to tell you that I think this is only the second time that I have been in this room. And the first time that I was here, I was up there. Because when I was at this university, this society did not admit women. We were only allowed to be up there. And I recall the only time the mistress of Girton got to her feet to address the assembled Girtonians before Hall was on the occasion when this society voted to admit women. But by then I was in my third year and I thought it's not worth the money. <laughs> so I never came again. But it is a great joy to be here now. Uh, I am aware that many of you will be law students, but some of you aren't. So I hope that what I say will not be too naive for the law students or too esoteric for the non-lawyers. But you are welcome to ask me any questions uh, when I have finished. Um, from time immemorial, the start of the legal year has been the 1st of October. And the judges assemble in their finest robes and wigs in Westminster Abbey to pray for divine guidance on their labours. Now the law lords, being members of the House of Lords and not members of the judiciary of England and Wales, used to attend by invitation in morning dress. Though when I became a law lord, I used to wear a suit and a hat. I used to wear a hat just to indicate that I was different from the chaps. I still wear a hat just to indicate that I'm different from the chaps. But everything changed on the 1st of October 2009. The Law Lords had become the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. We were now a proper court. And so we now join the procession in our splendid robes. So it's worthwhile asking, what else has changed and what has stayed the same since then? Well, what has not changed? Our jurisdiction hasn't changed. We're an appellate court. We hear appeals from England, Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, and from Scotland. Uh, but there's one change. We have taken over devolution issues from the Privy Council, and devolution issues are real constitutional issues. Did the Parliament of Scotland exceed its powers by passing legislation to ban cigarette machines? Nice question. Yeah. Was it or was it not within the scope of the powers that the UK Parliament had given it? This is a classic constitutional court type function. So we have acquired that function. Secondly, however, our role hasn't changed. We are not about to become the Supreme Court of the United States, Canada or anywhere else with a written constitution because those courts have got power to strike down acts of the UK Parliament. We do not have power to strike down acts of the UK Parliament as opposed to the Welsh Assembly, the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Scottish Parliament, which we can do. And whatever I may have said in a case called Jackson, <laughs> which the lawyers amongst you will have read, word for word, I am not going to predict uh, whether we might ever get to a crunch where we did so. But we know what the, we know what the problem is 
that was revealed in Jackson. We can go back to that if you like. However, Parliament has given us the power to <coughs> construe out of existence, ignore or declare incompatible acts of the UK Parliament in two different situations. Now, the law students know all this, uh, but non-law students won't necessarily know that we have two very different relationships with Europe. Under the European Communities Act, if a provision of an act of the UK Parliament is incompatible with a directly effective EU law right, we have either to interpret it the incompatibility away, or we have to disapply it. And we have to do that because the European Communities Act tells us that we have to do that. Parliament could, of course, repeal the European Communities Act. That would not be a matter for us. But while it's there, we do have to ignore provisions of the Act of, of Parliament. Now, we had two good examples last week. Uh, we had the prisoners' voting case where we gave judgment. And we also had a hearing in the challenges to the HS2 proposals. Now, the challenges to the HS2 proposals, one of them involved saying, the government plans to put this through, to give the power uh, to make the compulsory purchase orders, to get the planning consents, by an Act of Parliament, a hybrid Act of Parliament. Now, you'll all know what a hybrid Act of Parliament is. It's a government bill that affects private rights, directly affects private rights. Uh, and the government is proposing to whip that bill. So the principle of the bill will be decided at second reading under a government whip. So the argument is, that means that the requirements of the EU Directive on Environmental Impact Assessment and Public Participation will not be fulfilled by that process because there won't be sufficient public consultation involved in it. It, re it is required by that process that there is sufficient public consultation when all options are still open. That's what it says. So the argument is this hybrid bill process will not uh, fulfil the directive. Now, as we pointed out in the course of argument last week, it's one thing to say that we construe or give effect to Acts of Parliament in the way that the European Communities Act says, but are we allowed to tell Parliament how to do its job? Isn't there a little thing called Article 9 of the Bill of Rights? Now, you all know what that is, don't you? That's the one that says that proceedings in Parliament shall not be questioned in any court or place out of Parliament. Fundamental principle of the British Constitution. So, that was last week's case. Yeah, that was a bit interesting, really. Um, uh, the, the Human Rights Act gives us a rather different relationship with Acts of Parliament. We, don't have, we are not allowed to ignore or disapply incompatible legislation if we can't interpret it away. Um, but uh, we do have the question of whether we should give a remedy. And we were asked to give a remedy to say that the exclusion of prisoners from the franchise was incompatible with the, the, their convention rights. Well, we handed down judgment last week and we declined to make such a, a further declaration, partly because there'd already been one, so why do another one? But also because the two people who were asking for this declaration were both of them convicted murderers still in prison. And uh, I said very clearly, and I think my colleagues agreed with me, that the one thing we're not going to do is to make a declaration of incompatibility on the application of two people whose rights are no way personally being infringed. We need to keep it for the people who deserve these things, whose rights are being infringed. But you can see that we have this very complicated relationship uh, with, uh, with Parliament. Now, whether there could be any other circumstances in which we could say that what Parliament had done was invalid is the big question, the Jackson question. And all I want to say about that is we do have two fundamental principles in our Constitution. One is the sovereignty of Parliament and the other is the rule of law. 
So what do we do if Parliament uses its sovereignty fundamentally to attack the rule of law? Because the rule of law says that everybody, not Parliament, because Parliament can make or unmake any law, but everybody is subject to the law and the courts can tell the powers that be that what they have done is unlawful. So if the Parliament were to say, you cannot judicially review certain acts of public authorities, that would be a direct clash between those two fundamental principles <coughs> and what would we do about it? I do not know the answer to that question. I did not say there was an answer to that question in Jackson, but I know that's the crunch question in our constitution. Not that we have any tanks, but then neither does Parliament have any tanks. So, our role hasn't changed. Our jurisdiction hasn't changed. Our role hasn't changed. The type of cases we take hasn't changed. As Lord Bingham, former law lord, said, the Supreme Court dines a la carte. We take the cases we fancy taking. Aren't we lucky? Uh, they are cases that involve an arguable point of law. So if the law is clear, we don't interfere just because the Court of Appeal may have applied it wrongly to the facts of the particular case. It's got to be a point of law, so not a point of practice or procedure usually, or costs or something boring like that, but we do take the odd costs case if they do raise something of great importance. Um, and it has to be of general public importance. That means it matters to people more than the parties to the case. So the mere fact that loads of money is involved in the particular case is not enough anymore. In the olden days, the cases the House of Lords used to take involved loads of money. Uh, um, but we, involve, we take the cases that involve loads of people. Um, and uh, that's really the principal criterion. And then there's another little criterion which says, which ought to be decided by the Supreme Court at this time, blah, 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 which means it's got to be a good case in which to take the point. And sometimes it's not a good case to take the point because the person's already got what they wanted out of the litigation or the lawyers haven't seen what the point is, so there's no point in our in allowing them to argue it because they won't do it well. Or sometimes the merits of the case are so strong in one direction or the other that that's going to skew the decision on the point of law. We don't confess any of this, but that's the truth. So, so what do we take? Well, we take big constitutional points, MPs' expenses. Remember that case? It's a big constitutional point because, again, it's Article 9 of the Bill of Rights. Now, were there expenses, claims, proceedings in Parliament, which ought not to be questioned in any court or place out of Parliament? Well, the answer is pretty clear, not least because Parliament actually wanted the ordinary courts to deal with this problem rather than have to deal with it themselves internally. Uh, but it was, a, it was a big point, and so we took it. Uh, treaty obligations, large number of cases about refugees because of the Geneva Convention on the Status of Refugees uh, raises all kinds of questions. But those are big human rights type questions on the Refugee Convention. But then we also have a case coming up this term on the Warsaw Convention, which has to do with air tra uh, um, carriage of people by air uh, and uh, compensation. And it has to do with a disabled person who was, treat, who was promised that he would have a seat on the plane with his wife next door to him so that she could look after him while he was on the plane. And he had various intimate things that needed to be done. Uh, and when he got there, he found that he was seated, they were seated a long way apart and he, you know, it was just terrible. Is that covered by the Warsaw Convention or not? Is there any liability? I don't know. I've said EU law and human rights law. Other things are UK-wide legislation um, that ought to be interpreted in the same way throughout the UK. Equality and non-discrimination law is a good example of that. And then we have all sorts of cases on the ordinary law. Coming out on Wednesday, we have a, the next big case on negligence, which is all about a little girl of 10 who went with her class at school on a swimming lesson. Uh, compulsory part of the national curriculum, so the school had to put on swimming lessons. Uh, they, go, they go to the pool. Half the class is taught by a teacher from the school. The other half is taught by an outsourced teacher. 
Uh, and this little girl suffers catastrophic injuries as a result, allegedly, we don't know the fact, uh, of the negligence of the outsourced teacher and or the outsourced lifeguard. I can see the lawyers thinking, oh yes, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's all about non-delegable duties and whether the school still owes a duty of care or a duty to see that care is taken by the people they get to perform their obligations to the child. Now, I say the lawyers will understand that that's really rather important and it has implications for, you know, outsourcing generally. Anyway, that's coming out on Wednesday. Um, and, uh, of course, other sorts of cases like Radmacher and Granatino are prenuptial agreements um, binding. Jones and Kernot, property rights of unmarried couples, lots and lots of other cases that we have. So, sorts of cases we do don't change. And the final thing that doesn't change is the composition of the court. We've still got 11 men and me. <laughs> I don't believe I'm a man. I do not want to be a man. Um, it's not only that that makes me different from them, though. Most of them Actually, 10 out of the 11 in each of these examples went to an independent school, to a single-sex school, to a boarding school. Uh, all but one went to Oxbridge. Well, I did that, so I'm the same on that. <laughs> all but one, i.e. me, uh, got where they are today because of being successful practitioners at the bar. Uh, whereas I got there by being a successful academic lawyer and then public servant at the Law Commission. So I call it the quadrangle to quadrangle to quadrangle syndrome. The quadrangles of their public schools, the quadrangles uh, at uh, Oxbridge, and the quadrangles at the Inns of Court. Um, and the, the final thing, until very recently, most of them were in practice in property commercial company that sort of area of practice. And there were very few people who had had much to do with ordinary folks law. Big change. Last two years, three of us started our full-time judicial careers in the family division. Now, isn't that wonderful? It shows the family division has some brains. It makes my life harder, of course, because now I have to convince those two as well as, you know, in the olden days when I was the only family division judge there, uh, and the only woman, uh, they tended to take my word for it as to what family laws are. <laughs> it's much harder now. I have to convince the other two too, and we don't always agree, though we mainly do, but not entirely. So, uh, but I, I regard that as a very good thing because it does just show that those subjects are as important as the uh, ones with, which involve loads of money. So what's changed? Our place of work has changed. There we are in the former Middlesex Guildhall, beautifully converted. Um, it's robust masculinity stripped away. So it's now very light and bright and welcoming. Uh, we have three courtrooms, which means that we can sit as a nine or seven judge court whenever we fancy it. And those of you who do read our judgments will realize that we are sitting in larger panels much more frequently uh, we think that's a good thing. It means that the world can't say, if it's a five-judge case and they, dis they split three-two on a difficult point, the world can't say, oh, if only Justice X had been sitting rather than Justice A, the result would have been different. They can still say it, but the more justices there are sitting, the harder it is for them to say. Other thing that's changed is the style of our judgments. We don't have to be bound by the House of Lords rules. Second thing that's changed, our relations with the public has changed. It's very easy to come and see us. Any of you who might be interested to come and see us, all you have to do is turn up at the door and come in. Uh, you do have to go through some security, but there's not a long queue like there is in Parliament, and our security guards are supposed to be friendly and welcoming, and I think they mostly are. And you can potter around the building and pop your nose around the corner of any court that's sitting and see what's going on. Um, and uh, loads of people just do that. We have loads of student parties, loads of school parties, WI parties, Rotary Club parties, you know, lots of 
people come round. Uh, but loads of people just pop in, and that's great. Uh, also, uh, our proceedings are filmed. We are the only court at the moment whose proceedings are routinely filmed. If you want to go on the Sky News website and watch what we do, you can. It is incredibly tedious <laughs> for anybody who isn't party to the case or knows what's going on, but you can do it. And in fact, there are people who do do it, and people who've got a particular interest in the case quite frequently do. Our judgments, the little explanations that we give when we hand down judgments, are now all on YouTube since last October. So you can look at that little explanation and maybe it will tell you something. Uh, apparently, we're, we're, on, we, we're on Twitter and do tweeting, but I think that's only news. And we have a, the website's okay. So that's changed quite a bit. We're much more accessible, I think. Our relations with Parliament have, of course, changed because as law lords, we were full members of Parliament and could speak and vote on anything that went on in Parliament, should we so wish, and some did, but most didn't. If you did, it was a risky business. Two of my colleagues voted against the hunting bill. Now, you do know the hunting bill was the bill that took up more parliamentary time than any other piece of legislation in the last administration, i.e. the Labour government over the ten the years that it was in, in power. Um, two of my colleagues voted against it. That meant that they couldn't sit on any of the three wonderful cases that we had dealing with the, the hunting bill. Now, what a disability. One of them was Jackson, of course, as we've, we've already mentioned, but we had another one which alleged that the, it was contrary to the Human Rights Act and another one that alleged that it was contrary to EU law. So, mostly people didn't actually engage in those, those sorts of uh, activities. Uh, so, it's not a big change. We can no longer speak and vote in the House of Lords, but we do, those of us who are members of the House of Lords, which are all of those who were uh, on the 1st of October 2009, we still have our passes. <laughs> so we can still go in, um, which is quite a nice thing to do. Our relations with the government have changed. And this is actually, I think, the most crucial thing and the reason why some people were against setting up the Supreme Court. And that is that when we were in Parliament, Parliament arranged all you know, our buildings, our uh, IT, the library, our staff, the personnel. So they did everything for us, really. Whereas now we have to do all that for ourselves. We have to have our own library, we have to have our own building, our own building manager, you know, the chap who comes around and changes the light bulbs and all that sort of stuff. You know, that's all part of our budget now. So we cost a lot more and we need to employ a lot more people. And when we're in Parliament, this such extra funding as we cost came directly from parliamentary funding. As you know, Parliament votes its own resources. Now we have to go through the normal treasury process of department. We are a separate cost centre and we do our own sort of pretty, but we have to go through the normal processes of competing for funds like anybody else. And we are dependent on the Ministry of Justice to make up the shortfall between what we can earn by court fees and our own uh, wider market initiatives, it's known, of, known as. That means actually letting out our rooms for functions. We haven't yet decided to get a civil marriage licence, but I'm wondering, I'm wondering whether we will one of these days. I hope not. But uh, you can see that there are now funding issues that there didn't used to be. And there are branding issues because quite a lot of our services we buy in from the Ministry of Justice. So the whole idea of separating us from Parliament, yes, we are separate from Parliament. We always were and have been separate from government, but we no longer look as separate from government as we did when we were in Parliament. So you can see why some people thought it wasn't such a good idea. So I was a supporter of the move um, because I was very uncomfortable in Parliament. I didn't want to be part of a political or, or, or legislative body. And the more effective the House of Lords gets at doing its job of checking what the House of Commons does, the less comfortable I felt being part of it. And it did become, it has become, noticeably more effective in recent years. But the increasing importance and visibility of what we do seems to me 
to make it all the more important who we are. So the big battle still is to try and change the situation where I'm the only one here talking to you as a female member of the Supreme Court. So that's all I wanted to say to you. Over to you. I, I want to thank Baroness Hell for that fantastic speech, but now we're going to throw it out to the floor for questions. So obviously we encourage you all to ask questions, you probably have some really, really burning ones. Would anyone like to step up to the plate? Wait for a mic to come to you, by the way, so everyone can hear you. Um, yeah, do you want yeah. to field the questions from here? Yeah. Hello, thank you, Baroness, for coming to speak to us today. Um, I was interested when you mentioned that um, the proceedings of the Supreme Court are now televised. Um, do you think that has made people behave more dramatically than they would if it wasn't televised? And if so, do you, do you think it's had a beneficial effect on just court proceedings in general? <laughs> I don't think it's had any effect at all. Um, and that is because these cameras are very unobtrusive and they, they're there all the time. They're our cameras, so we're in charge of what happens to the footage. I mean, if we didn't like the web streaming, we could stop it tomorrow. Um, the big difference between us and what, the, what is proposed for the other courts is that the media would bring their own cameras in. And they no doubt would not do it every day and for every case. They couldn't. I mean, courtrooms up and down the country, not even the Lord Chief Justice's court. They wouldn't have cameras there all the time. And the bringing in of a camera which is not always there obviously may change people's behaviour. I'm not saying that it would, but it may. It's more likely to. Um, I don't think people play to the cameras any more now than they did in the House of Lords. In the House of Lords, you could tell the barristers came with their prepared five minutes of opening remarks, uh, which were aimed at uh, the reporters, who were, of course, necessarily in the room, <laughs> They still come with their five minutes prepared opening remarks, um, but the reporters are usually not in the room. That's the only difference that it's made. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned earlier that so long as the European Communities Act is on the statute books, when judges are presented with an act of parliament that appears to be incompatible with it, you have to declare that it is incompatible. We have to ignore it. In the you have, you have to ignore the Act of Parliament, yes. Now, that seems that the judges have created a, a certain instance of curtailing the sovereignty of Parliament in a way that didn't exist before, insofar as under the old system, if Parliament passed an act that were incompatible with the previous one, you would assume that it had impliedly repealed it. Uh, whereas now, judges have created a special status for the European Communities Act that if a future act is incompatible, you assume that Parliament did not intend to uh, impliedly repeal uh, the Communities Act and thereby sort of force them to accidentally repeal it. What would you say the implications are of this for the sovereignty of Parliament and for Britain's constitutional future insofar as the judiciary has created uh, this special curtailment of parliamentary sovereignty? You said three times the judiciary did it. I ask you to go and read section two, subsection four. <laughs> Will do. Of the European Communities Act. That is what sub the second clause in the first sentence of subsection two, uh, sec subsection four of section two of the European Communities Act was all designed to do. It may be that those members of parliament who voted for it didn't realize that. Um, but it basically says that any act passed or to be passed shall be construed consistently with the foregoing provisions of this section. I haven't got it entirely right, but it's words to that effect. The foregoing provisions of this section giving direct effect to directly effective community law rights. So it's quite clear that that's what Parliament intended. There really is no doubt about that. Uh, so the judges didn't do it. Parliament did it to itself. Um, <laughs> I have no doubt that Parliament could repeal Section 2 of the European Communities Act. It could repeal the European Communities Act in toto. Uh, it would do so if it was decided to withdraw from the European Union. That is not a matter for us. That's a political question. I have no view. Thank you. Much. 
Good evening. A legal question. And no doubt uh, the law students in this room will have burned in their brains, you know, your uh, judgment in Stack and Dowden. And um, my question had specifically to do to your response to critics of the far more expansive view you took regarding proprietary entitlement. Uh, I, I think of Lord Neuberger in particular. And my question is, how would you respond to critics who said that a, a more liberal, liberal approach um, upends, you know, uh, aspects of certainty and, you know, centuries-long traditions of how trusts within the domestic context have hitherto been applied? And do you have any regrets about that expansive view that you took in that case? That's a lot of questions, isn't it? <laughs> yep. Well, just as with the previous question, I'm actually going to challenge the premise. I don't think that the majority, and I, the majority in Stack and Dowden included Lord Hoffman and Lord Walker, both of them chancery lawyers of um, considerable distinction. Um, and so I don't think that I was doing anything particularly distinctive. We may have been. But of course, the whole debate about how beneficial interests are created in property that is legally owned by X or X and Y, uh, to what extent do you um, say that the legal owner holds on trust for somebody else or some other people uh, differently from how the legal uh, ownership is, is, um, is held, is a question that depends to some extent on your starting point Stack and Dowden was about the starting point. And to some extent, on whether you think that it should be governed by who paid for what, or whether it should be governed by what you assume the party's intentions were when they acquired the property. Uh, th there are two streams that, that look at it from those points of view. The idea, starting point, if it's in joint names, we said starting point is that it's jointly owned beneficially. And the idea that the great majority of people who own their homes, husbands and wives, unmarried couples, whoever, who own their homes in joint names, intend that if one of them dies, there will be a post-mortem inquiry into who paid for what over the whole course of the ownership of that house is pretty silly. And you only have to look at it in that light and realise, because you're looking at you, it doesn't change according to the reason why you're asking the question. The question is the same question. What are the beneficial interests? And I am quite sure that most people, if they put the house into joint names, assume that they will own it jointly. I mean, there are complicated questions that come out of it. I'm not, I'm not denying that. But that's what Stack and Dowden was about. And then to what extent do differential contributions to the acquisition actually displace that presumption? Uh, and what, what do you take into account? Do you only take into account financial contributions or do you take into account a wider range of things? The majority said you take into account a wider range of things. But surprise, surprise, we actually decided roughly in accordance with financial contributions. So there is an article that says, do as I say and not as I do, um, which is quite a reasonable comment on the case. Okay. Uh, goodness me, where's the... Who, who was here first? Were you here first? I think so. I think you were, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Baroness Hill, thank you for your speech. Uh, I remember a remark by the late Professor Ronald Dworkin that jurisprudence is the general part of adjudication. And I just wanted to ask, I know that this isn't something that permeates the law reports and the judgments that are made, but to what extent is an understanding of broader philosophies of law useful when one reaches the apex of a country's courts? Oh, dear. <laughs> I don't know whether it is still the case in this university, 
But when I was an undergraduate here, jurisprudence was not compulsory. I think we were probably the only university in the country where jurisprudence was not a compulsory part uh, of the university course, and so I never studied jurisprudence. <laughs> I studied legal history and um, the, the uh, deeper law of obligations, as I think it's probably now called. It used to be called Contract and Tort too. It was the most wonderful course about concepts and principles in the law really wonderful. And legal history, of course, is a wonderful course about concepts and principles in the law. But I never actually studied the philosophy of law, except when I got to Manchester as a university teacher, and you could not uh, actually be in the same department as Nigel Simmons and not learn a lot about philosophy of law. The law <laughs> students will know this, because, of course, Nigel is now a reader here and uh, the most compelling legal philosopher that I've certainly ever met uh, sort of face to face. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I do think that any judge who is trying to decide difficult points of law does have to have an appreciation of the wider consequences of what you're doing. Doesn't mean that you don't do it just because it's going to have wider consequences, but you, you need to know what those wider consequences are. And it is helpful to be able to locate the decisions that you're making in some sort of uh, broader conceptual, but I'd also say social structure. See, as a family lawyer, I was always very interested in the social context of what we were doing, uh, rather than simply the legal context <coughs> of what we're doing. Equality law, or similarly, one needs to know the social context. So there are loads of different contexts in which one wants to look uh, at the task of adjudication. Difficult though it is. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I think that, I think, I think you would, I'm not, I'm not being very good at working out, I think you should come next, yes. <laughs> that would be very, after, after, after this, gentleman. Yes. That would be very short. Um, I think you've mentioned in the beginning of your speech that the Supreme Court was not meant to be and should perhaps not become like a full-blown constitutional court like other countries have, That's you're right. thinking specifically of Germany. Uh, I'm curious if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, that, that's right. But of course, the common law countries and the civilian countries tend to have a different concept of a constitutional court anyway. In the common law countries, um, the constitutional questions come before the ordinary courts. Uh, but if they have a written constitution, there will be constitutional questions. So the Supreme Court of the United States is an ordinary court. It deals with perfectly ordinary questions of statutory construction, ordinary questions of common law. It deals with the same sorts of questions that we deal with, but it also has this additional role of ruling on the constitutionality of acts of the federal parliament. And the same is true of the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, High Court of Australia, yes, they deal with the same sorts of issues, although in a more limited focus. Uh, the uh, Constitutional Court of South Africa is not quite the same. Whereas in a country like Germany, you have a separate constitutional court that rules on the constitutionality of legislation. And the ordinary courts uh, have, a, have a different function, the, the Calcinian uh, principle of a constitutional court. Uh, it was suggested when people were thinking about models for a Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, that we might turn into that sort of court where constitutional questions were referred. It was a non-starter. Um, two reasons. Difficult to know what a constitutional question is when you don't have a written constitution. It's not that we don't have a constitution, but it is quite difficult to know which ones. And the second one is, it is completely alien to the common law tradition to be deciding a case in the abstract. We decide concrete cases. X has done this to Y. No. The government department has done this to Y. Uh, what's the consequences of that? We don't decide cases in the abstract, which is why I was so against deciding the prisoner's voting case in the abstract. One wants to look at these particular people and have their rights uh, been infringed. So it was a non-starter. That's the difference.
Sorry, I hope that explains. Now, this young lady here. Thank you, I was wondering, because um, throughout the um, legal system and the change of the law, there have been lots of um, legal issues which have addressed the protection of women, for example, rape cases or um, the law of rape or wrongful conception cases. And I was wondering, firstly, um, in your opinion, whether there are any other areas of law which required a more gender-centered um, approach. And secondly, whether the demographics within the judicial system, um, in terms of more female representation within the judicial system, um, is required to support these legal issues. Mm, yeah. That's two questions, and they're two rather different questions. Uh, gender issues are all pervasive. Uh, I mean, there are obvious ones, like reproductive rights, um, like bodily autonomy rights, like violence. Um, I'd say prenups are a gender issue, but you know, a provision within responsibility within the family. Uh, responsibility for bringing up children. These, these are obviously gendered things. Uh, but I can remember making some remark to some feminist scholar friends of mine. Well, I wonder, is there a feminist um, perspective on company law? To be told, yes, there is. Now, I've no idea what it is. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't know if you've encountered a book called Feminist Judgments. Uh, any, of, any of you who are interested in feminism, this is a book which rewrites judgments in 25 famous cases. And they're from all over the law. They're not just the obvious ones. And uh, some feminist scholars have tried to take on the judges at their own game and written convincing judgments in the style that could have been written using the materials that were available at the time and putting a different feminist slant on lots of areas. So that will give you some start. Um, I have to say that at least two of my judgments are, are, are kind of um, improved upon uh, in this book. Clearly, the mark for me is could do better. Uh, uh, and so it's a very chastening experience, but it, it's, it's good. I mean, obviously, things like um, uh, the whole honor killing, uh, forced marriage area, which is really, we're only beginning at trafficking, uh, modern slavery. These are gendered issues by and large, though not completely. That's a, that's a big area that's developing, but it's potentially anywhere. There's a gentleman down there. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could say a few words about marriage and where it's at and where it's going. Um, oh. so, so, so I guess my question is sort of framed around the idea that marriage still has some very practical consequences for couples, particularly when they break up and either do or don't have a right to ancillary relief. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, within the marriage as an institution, we're seeing sort of changes going on at the moment with things like the introduction of the same-sex marriage bill, the decision in Radmacher and Granatino, in which it seemed that you took a, per perhaps a slightly more traditionalist view than the other judges, um, and the increased rise of perhaps no-fault divorce. So, increased rise of no-fault divorce? Well, 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 We've had no-fault divorce since 1973. Well, the availability of no-fault divorce. <laughs> uh, mm. Let me see. I think there's quite a lot to be said for an opt-in status that gives people embarking upon an intimate life together uh, special responsibilities towards one another and corresponding rights. And that's what marriage is. I think there's lots to be said for it. Um, mainly because the results of such relationships are very unpredictable. They change a great deal over time. So that at the start of the relationship, it's extremely difficult to work out what the course of the relationship is going to be and what will be the situation at the end of it. It generates 
um, responsibilities it, not to, to, to the couple and to children and sometimes to wider family as well. I think there's lots to be said for it. Um, and I think it is reasonable for the law to draw a distinction between the opt-in status and less formal arrangements. <coughs> I'm all in favour of making that opt-in status available to same-sex couples as well as to uh, opposite-sex couples. I don't have any problem with that. I'm really quite upset that there are people who don't like the connotations of marriage uh, and therefore don't opt into it when it would clearly be in their best interest so to do, or sensible so to do. Um, and that is because, you know, when I was your age, um, marriage had all this baggage of patriarchy and you know, male domination and horrible things like that. Well, in UK law now, it doesn't. Um, so, it, it, that's not a rational attitude to have. But then nobody's rational about marriage anyway. I mean, you're <laughs> not expected to be. Having said all that, that does not mean that I don't think that people who live together um, in a, a committed relationship for a certain amount of time or who have children together should not have better remedies against one another to compensate for the consequences of that than they currently have. I certainly think they should. And there's a very fine Scottish case, because the Scots do have um, remedies to deal with this. Um, and uh, we uh, interpreted those remedies in a way in which I think they were originally intended to be, but in quite a liberal way. Uh, and uh, at the same time said, what a good idea it would be if they had them in England and Wales too. So I've got both of those positions. I don't think they're inconsistent with one. With one. Ah, there's somebody back there. I haven't been looking at the back. Yes. One or other of you two. <laughs> Um, well, good evening. Um, I think that the UK has a very good legal system and has very good judges, obviously. I think, you know, I, I, I think that, I mean, <laughs> I think that most judges in the UK would never have even been offered a bribe in their entire career, let alone yeah. accepted one. Okay. Um, so if you look, say, at the Human Rights Act, I think it's fair to say that over the last decade since then, the European Court of Human Rights has had more and more influence, at least. And do you fear, not on sort of a principled basis, but just on the practicalities that, that perhaps the judges at the European Court of Human Rights, not necessarily corrupt, but are, are just not as high quality judges and the quality of legal reasoning is not as high there? Mm. <laughs> now, what can I say? Uh, you are entirely <coughs> correct to say that uh, <coughs> conventional corruption is unknown in the British judiciary. I, th I think I can say that with some confidence. Uh, there are maybe more subtle uh, types of influence that do have um, a, a subliminal effect. Who can say? I have no idea uh, whether this affects any of the judges of the Strasbourg Court. One of the virtues of the Strasbourg Court is that their chambers are a minimum of seven. And of course the grand chamber decisions are 17. <coughs> there is great safety in numbers. And some of the judges of the uh, Strasbourg Court are totally remarkable people. Uh, and they tend to be the section uh, presidents who have a lot of influence on what goes on. Um, and, and so I don't share the contemptuous attitude that is expressed by some people towards that court. I'm sure its judges are of variable quality as judges are the world over. Um, 
and uh, it, there may be difficulties that some of them come from quite small jurisdictions where the range of choice is not enormous. But then on the other hand, we have an ethnic quota in our own Supreme Court in that we have to have two Scots and one Irish. Um, and uh, nobody has ever suggested that they are not, although they come from small countries, uh, very, very valuable members of the court. Uh, so I, I don't quite share that about Strasbourg. It's more interesting to look at Luxembourg. <laughs> where there have been concerns about political influence more than, not, not corruption in the, in the individual sense, but political influence. Um, and they're making very serious efforts to counteract that with the appointments process. Uh, one of the reasons why they have unanimous judgments in Luxembourg, which are a great pain for us all, because any judgment where there's no dissent means it is the lowest common denominator of the reasoning that the judges will sign up to. Um, but one of the reasons for doing that is so that people are a bit immune from political influence because nobody can know who said what. So I can see that there are, there are subtle problems there, but I'm not going to buy Strasbourg as a terrible court. I'm certainly not going to buy the criticism that, oh dear, some of its judges are academics. <laughs> and the lady just, just in front of you. Uh, you spoke rather generally about the aim of diversifying the judiciary, and I was just wondering whether you thought there were any steps which could or should be taken to promote the creation of a judiciary which reflects the fact that the people who it serves to, um, who it aims to serve, sorry, uh, are not all white, public schooled and male. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, the trouble is I bang on about this such a lot uh, that I thought I wouldn't bang on about it here unless asked. But you've asked me, so... <laughs> um, and I've given some of the answer. Some of the answer is that we have a divided legal profession <coughs> coupled with assumptions about who gets what job. Uh, and we have a judicial profession which is divided into four separate streams with direct entry at each level. So we have the high court, mostly direct entry. I call that the officer class, you see direct entry there. And then we have the circuit bench, these are the NCOs, but we have direct entry to that. And then we have the district bench, both in the magistrates' courts and the county court, at, at, where, again, we have direct entry to that. And then we have the tribunal judiciary, again, with direct entry. Hugely diverse judiciary, the tribunal judiciary, in terms of their jurisdiction, they're also much the most diverse in terms of their gender, and their ethnicity and their professional backgrounds. So the tribunal judiciary is the model, in a sense, of how you manage to recruit. Uh, and that is because an awful lot of people can become tribunal judges. They don't have the same assumptions about who gets it. So coupled with the assumptions about who gets each of the other sorts of jobs and the fact that you cannot transfer easily from one branch of the judiciary to another. Uh, these are both of them big barriers. And I think lots could be done to address those barriers. More transferability of judicial skills. You know, if somebody has been a judge in the employment tribunal or in even more in the residential property tribunal, deciding, a residential property tribunal decides quite complicated points of property law, uh, but also, they involve a lot of money. You know, what it's going to cost to enfranchise a block of flats in London, that's a lot of money. Um, now, they should be able to transfer into court-based adjudication without a great deal of difficulty. And that's true of all sorts of, of judges. But every time a judge wants to move, 
they tend to have to go to the same, the same application and competition process that the direct entry people are doing. So the district judges who want to become circuit judges have to compete uh, and become recorders, i.e. part-time circuit judges, along with being full-time district judges. And to become recorders, they have to compete with the barristers and solicitors who are applying to become recorders. Now, that's a very weird thing. So somebody's got to get to grips with that whole structure. And report after report has said that, but the problem is, who does it? because we've now got fragmented responsibility. But I think that's a big thing that can be done. And another big thing that can be done is to encourage more qualified people to apply and to be much more open about the profile, what you have in your head about who can do it. Um, an expectation that the court service has that any appointment can hit the ground running, which means that... It, automatically favours people who practice in the particular jurisdiction concerned. Now, that could be challenged and, and attacked. So there are lots of things that could be done. And there is also, they've now brought in, or are going to bring in this uh, provision that says that if you have two candidates of equal merit, you can prefer the one who is representative of the underrepresented group. I have absolutely no problem with that. That makes sense. I, I've some suspicion about whether equal merit is a real concept or not. Uh, I have a lot of suspicion about the concept of merit. Everybody's got all sorts of qualities. Yeah. How do you rank them? Final question? Or um, maybe... Yeah, like it's to... up to you. Um, you. Maybe you'd like to take maybe two more? Yeah, two more. Have we got two more? We've got that gentleman there. <laughs> Evening, evening, Baroness. Um, I'm from a jurisdiction, South Africa, where a judicial transformation is quite high up on the agenda. Yeah. Uh, I suspect you may have given some indication as to what your answer to this question is going to be, but I'll give it to you anyway. There are really two schools of thought. The one is that judicial transformation is a numbers game, so half your judiciary should be female, in South Africa, 70% 70 should, 70 should be black, you know, Indian colored, etc., etc. The other school of thought is that it's a slightly more nuanced question. It's will the judges be sensitive to the specific needs of the individuals appearing before them? Will they be cognizant of the history of your country and of the inequalities, uh, you know, barriers to entry that women or other minority groups might experience? What do you think it means for a judiciary to be broadly representative of its populace? Is it a numbers game or is it a sensitivities game? Well, I suspect it's both. Um, it's a very good question, if I may say so. I mean, all the questions have been good, but I think this is, a, this is one which I'll go away and think about um, even more. Uh, I think the first, the sensitivities should be a sine qua non of being appointed a judge. I think that judges should try and understand the situation of the people who are appearing in front of them, and they should try and understand the context. That was why I was answering about context being as important as philosophy uh, to the judging game. I think that's very, very important. Uh, and not everybody... <laughs> But you've got a better chance of that context being understood and appreciated if you have a more diverse group of people doing it. You know, my brother's assumption says empathy, or the capacity to empathise, is okay, that's enough. You don't need any women as long as you've got men who can understand how women think. Well, I suspect that's not good enough. So it is a bit of a numbers game, uh, but the first is, is absolutely essential. Um, the numbers are important not only for the quality of the decision making, but for how it looks to the world that's being judged. I don't know that we're still in a world where people believe that a certain class has the right to judge them. And it, you only have to put it that way to realize that something's got to be done. 
Um, and that, of course, is true in South Africa to an even greater extent. But nobody would have thought, uh, for example, that you should not have Albie Sachs on the Constitutional Court of South Africa because he happens to be a white male, um, uh, I think, independently <coughs> educated uh, and um, uh, blue chip university educated as well because he had the empathy in spades and still does. Uh, and so that's why I say that's the more important thing. Both matter. Now, one more. Let's have somebody from over here, yes. <laughs> oh, it's this girl with the, with the purple scarf. But there's one more lady who is burning to speak, so you can be the last one. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I just wondered whether you thought the law on assisted suicide would ever be changed through the common law, or if it's one of those matters that will just continue to be left to Parliament. Well, that's a very good question. But do you know we've got that question coming up before us just before Christmas? I didn't know when it was. Yes, it's it. just before Christmas. Uh, it'll take, unless it has to come out of the list for some reason or other, so it'll take up most of the last week of term. So you could tune in and have a look and see what the, how the <laughs> argument goes. And then you could watch this space to see what we do about it. OK. Right, so that lady there in the blue top. Um, I was just wondering how much you share the concerns of the barristers that were engaged in a lot of legal aid funded work you know, who have been striking recently over the um, proposed government, well, continued government cuts headed by the Ministry of Justice by the first non-lawyer Lord Chancellor. I just wondered what, if you had any views you could share with us. If you know. Well, I'm not going to say that I approve of striking. I don't know whether I, that's not my business, you know. Um, we have to be very difficult, we judges, commenting on legal aid cuts um, because it does get interpreted by government as interfering in political matters. Uh, but I, my president has been quite forthcoming on these issues and so have I to a certain extent uh, in that we are, the, the judiciary are generally concerned about the implications for access to justice uh, of the current and proposed um, changes to the legal aid scheme, the taking out of vast areas of, of legal, legally important matters from the scope of legal representation, legal help, legal advice. Um, discrimination, for example, no longer. Um, family disputes between husband and wife or parent and, uh, or mother and father taken out. Now, and, and there are many, many other areas uh, where it's been taken away. Um, the problem with this is that either people will not realise that they've got a good claim and won't pursue it, or they will realise they've got a good claim and pursue it but inefficiently, or they will think they've got a claim when they haven't and pursue that <laughs> efficiently or inefficiently. Because uh, the business of a lawyer is to, uh, is to help people identify what is and is not a good claim uh, and to uh, help them to pursue it as efficiently as, and sensibly, and sensibly, you know, uh, as, as can be. And that is a big problem. <coughs> that there will be people who uh, will be faced with either not bringing claims or not defending claims or doing it all very badly. And of course, the worst feature is that there will still be often in these cases one side who can afford to be legally represented. So we will have a massive increase in the cases where the more powerful party has a lawyer and the less powerful party doesn't. And throughout my adult life, we were getting more and more to a situation of some equality, and now it's being taken away. Now, maybe I'm an old-fashioned idealist, uh, but I believe in access to justice. I don't think that litigation is always a bad thing. <coughs> it is, of course it ought not to be first resort. Of course not. People should try and settle their differences by agreement. Um, but in the end, Litigation is important, that people should have access to the courts to be able 
to resolve their disputes. Um, and if they don't, they suffer, and the law suffers, and the legal system suffers, because we have kind of private arrangements going on all around the place, which nobody knows anything about, so nobody knows what their rights are. So that is a summary of sort of three lectures that several people give. Uh, but I think most of us do feel really quite strongly about it and are very worried for the future. Uh, but I won't say that it's just because we've got a Lord Chancellor who is a non-lawyer that we are in this situation. I think we'd probably be in it uh, even if we had a Lord Chancellor who was a lawyer. Uh, because nobody likes lawyers and they do like to try and cut the legal aid budget. <laughs> Before we all thank Baroness Hell for giving up her time and for this incredible evening, I hope you'll forgive me for a few announcements. Um, so first, tomorrow we have a Syria forum at 7 p.m. On Wednesday night at 7 p.m. we have our debating workshops where you can learn to find your voice. You're welcome to those even if you've never done debating before, especially if you've never done debating before. On Thursday we have our regular Thursday night debate. That's on privacy, featuring speakers like Peter Tatchell, David Davis, and the former head of GCHQ. And although it's not relevant for anyone in this room, if you all tell your friends that the last chance to join the union at a discounted rate of 170 pounds ends on Friday. So I'd like to, you all to join me in thanking Baroness Hale for this fantastic evening. <laughs>